This week, of course, we're looking at World War II, perhaps the largest event in the 20th century, but more importantly for our purposes, the largest defining event for American power in, in the 20th century. All of you know about World War II. It's not some sort of obscure historical topic. And we're going to talk about the war as sort of represented on the left by the, that flag raising on Suribachi during the Pacific War. Uh, but there's so much more about World War II than is generally talked about. All sorts of stuff on the home front, all sorts of stuff with international diplomacy, all sorts of, of things that um, really need to be really need to be talked about to round out our understanding of the uh, Second World War. And one of the ways I like to do that is with using Norman Rockwell's paintings of four freedoms. And you can see that image on the right there. They were the most popular works of art in World War II, the four freedoms by Norman Rockwell. What had happened is that in his State of the Union address before Congress in January 1941, President Roosevelt spoke of a future world order based on essential human freedoms. Freedom of, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. During the war, Roosevelt emphasized these freedoms as the Allies' war aims, and he compared them to the Ten Commandments, the Magna Carta, and the Emancipation Proclamation in terms of importance. Now, in these paintings, which he created in 1943, Rockwell portrayed ordinary Americans exercising these freedoms. You see on uh, the upper right there, a citizen speaking at a town meeting. Uh, to the left, there's uh, members of uh, different religious groups at prayer. There's a family enjoying Thanksgiving dinner at the bottom right. When you see that one a lot, that's an image that's used a lot. And it's also turned into memes by changing the faces of, uh, of the participants in the painting there. So you see that a lot as jokes on the internet, but that's the original there. And the final one is the mother and father standing over a sleeping child, and that is, of course, the freedom from fear. Now, though Rockwell presented images of small-town American life, the United States changed dramatically in the course of the war. Many post-war trends, social movements, had wartime origins. As in World War I, but on a far greater scale, wartime mobilization expanded the size and the reach of government, stimulated the economy, industrial output skyrocketed, and unemployment disappeared as war production finally ended the Depression. Demands for labor drew millions of, men, of women into the workforce and, and lured millions of migrants from rural America to the industrial cities of the North and West, permanently changing the nation's social geography. The war also gave the United States a new and lasting international role and reinforced the idea that America's security required the global dominance of American values and power. Government military spending unleashed rapid economic developments in the South and West of the United States, laying the basis for what we now call the modern Sun Belt. The war created a close alliance between big business and, militarized, and a militarized federal government, what President Dwight Eisenhower would later call the military-industrial complex. Moreover, perhaps the war reshaped the boundaries of American nationality. The government recognized the contributions of Americans' ethnic groups as loyal Americans. Black Americans' second-class status attracted national attention. However, when only so far, as you know, with, with, with the war, with the United States at war with Japan, the government forced more than 100,000 Japanese Americans, including those who were American citizens, into internment camps. The four freedoms thus produced a, nat a national unity that obscured divisions within America, divisions over whether free enterprise or the freedom of a global New Deal would dominate after the war, whether civil rights or white supremacy would define race relations, whether women would return to traditional roles in the household, or whether they'd enter the, la the labor market. The emphasis on freedom as an element of private life would become increasingly prominent in post-war America. Now on to the rest of the lecture, narrated by Dana Flowers. This shows a sheet of 50 miniature reproductions of World War II posters. The themes include invocations of freedom, depictions of the enemy, calls for disciplined labor, and warnings against inadvertently revealing military secrets. Artists for Victory, an organization founded in 1942, sponsored a national poster competition to encourage artists to use their talents to promote the Allied war effort 
With the country facing economic crisis in the 1930s, international affairs garnered little public attention. But Franklin Roosevelt innovated in foreign and domestic policy. In 1933, in an effort to encourage trade, he recognized the Soviet Union. FDR also repudiated the right to intervene with military force in the internal affairs of Latin American nations, called the Good Neighbor Policy. The United States withdrew troops from Haiti and Nicaragua and accepted Cuba's repeal of the Platt Amendment, which had authorized U.S. intervention in that nation. But like previous presidents, Roosevelt recognized undemocratic governments, such as that of Anastasio Somoza in Nicaragua, Rafael Trujillo in the Dominican Republic, and Fulgencio Batista in Cuba. However, the United States also took steps to counteract German influence in Latin America by expanding trade and promoting American culture there. Events in Asia and Europe quickly took center stage as international order and the rule of law seemed to disintegrate. In 1931, seeking to expand its power in Asia, Japan invaded Manchuria, a northern province in China. In 1937, it pushed further, committing a massacre of 300,000 Chinese prisoners of war and civilians at Nanjing. In Europe, after consolidating his rule within Germany, Hitler launched a campaign to dominate the continent. He violated the Versailles Treaty by pursuing a massive rearmament and, in 1936, by sending troops into the Rhineland, a demilitarized zone between France and Germany. The failure of Britain, France, and the United States to oppose his aggression convinced Hitler that these democracies would not resist his aggressions. Benito Mussolini, the father of fascism in Italy, invaded and conquered Ethiopia. When, in 1936, General Francisco Franco mounted a rebellion against the democratically elected government of Spain, Hitler and Mussolini sent men and arms to support him. In 1939, Franco won and established another fascist government in Europe. Hitler annexed Austria and Sudetenland, a German area of Czechoslovakia, and soon thereafter invaded and annexed all of that nation, too. Roosevelt became increasingly alarmed by Hitler's actions in Germany and Europe, but in 1937, he called only for a quarantine of aggressors. Roosevelt had little choice but to follow the appeasement policy of France and Britain, who hoped that agreeing to Hitler's demands could prevent war. In 1938, British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain returned from the Munich Conference of 1938, which awarded the Sudetenland to Hitler, promising peace in our time. This is the immensely popular Office of War Information poster reproducing Norman Rockwell's paintings of the Four Freedoms, President Franklin D. Roosevelt's shorthand for American purposes in World War II. This image shows a demonstration sponsored by Jewish organizations at New York's Madison Square Garden in March 1937 and demands American action against Nazi Germany. At this time, most Americans opposed getting involved in European affairs. The threat posed by Germany and Japan seemed distant to most Americans, and in fact, Hitler had many admirers in America, from those who praised his anti-communism to businessmen who profited from business with the Nazis, such as Henry Ford. Trade also continued with Japan, including shipments of American trucks, aircraft, and oil, which amounted to 80% of Japan's oil supply. Many Americans now believed that American involvement in World War I had been a mistake and had benefited only international bankers and arms producers. Pacifism attracted supporters across America, from small towns to college campuses. Americans of German and Italian descent also sympathized with fascist governments in their homelands, and Irish Americans remained staunchly anti-British. Isolationism dominated Congress, which in 1935 started to enact a series of neutrality acts banning travel on belligerent ships and arms shipments to warring nations. These were intended to prevent the United States from becoming embroiled in these conflicts by demanding freedom of the seas, just as it had in World War I. Even though the Spanish Civil War was a conflict between a democratic republic and a fascist dictator, the United States and other governments imposed an arms embargo on both sides. In 
effectively allowing Germany and Italy to help Franco overwhelm Spanish government forces. At Munich in 1938, Britain and France capitulated to Hitler's aggression. In 1939, the Soviet Union proposed an international agreement to oppose further German demands for territory. But Britain and France, both of which distrusted Stalin and saw Germany as a fortress that would check communist power in Europe, declined. Stalin soon signed a non-aggression pact with Hitler, his former enemy. Hitler immediately invaded Poland. Britain and France, allied with Poland, now declared war on Germany. Within a year, the Nazi Blitzkrieg, lightning war, overran Poland and much of Scandinavia, Belgium, and the Netherlands. By June 1940, German troops occupied Paris. Hitler now dominated Europe and North Africa, and in September 1940, Germany, Italy, and Japan formally created a military alliance known as the Axis Powers. For a full year, Britain, led by a resolute Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, alone resisted Germany, heroically defending British skies from German planes and bombers in the Battle of Britain. The Germans' bombs devastated London and other cities, but the German air campaign was eventually repelled. Churchill pointedly called on the New World to rescue the old. In this 1940 cartoon, War Clouds Engulf Europe, while Uncle Sam observes that the Atlantic Ocean no longer seems to shield the United States from involvement. Though Roosevelt considered Hitler a direct threat to the United States, most Americans simply wanted to avoid war. After a fierce debate in 1940, Congress approved plans for military rearmament and agreed to sell arms to Britain on a cash-and-carry basis. Britain would pay in cash for arms and transport them in British ships. But Roosevelt, who was mindful of a presidential election, went no further. Opponents of American intervention mobilized. They included such prominent individuals as Henry Ford, Father Coughlin, and Charles A. Lindbergh. In that 1940 election, Roosevelt broke precedent by running for a third presidential term. The Republican candidate was Wendell Wilkie, a Wall Street businessman, lawyer, and amateur politician. Little differentiated the two, as both supported the first peacetime draft law, passed in September 1940, and New Deal social legislation. FDR won the election by a decisive margin. In 1941, the United States became closer to the nations fighting Germany and Japan, and Roosevelt declared that America would be a great arsenal of democracy. With Britain close to bankruptcy, Roosevelt had Congress pass the Lend-Lease Act, allowing military aid to go to countries that promised to repay it after the war. Under this law, the United States funneled billions of dollars' worth of arms to China and the Soviet Union. Some Americans, called interventionists, actively campaigned for American involvement in the war, forming societies that demanded declarations of war against Germany. On December 7, 1941, Japanese planes launched a surprise attack from aircraft carriers, bombing the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. The assault killed more than 2,000 American soldiers and destroyed much of the base and the U.S. Pacific Fleet. Except for crucial U.S. aircraft carriers, which helped the nation win critical subsequent victories, calling December 7th a date which will live in infamy. Roosevelt asked Congress to declare war on Japan, which it did nearly unanimously. The next day, Germany, in turn, declared war on America. The United States had finally entered the largest war in history. This is a newsreel theater in New York Times Square, announcing Hitler's blitzkrieg in Europe in the spring of 1940. This image shows the battleships West Virginia and Tennessee in flames during the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Both were repaired and later took part in the Pacific War. Although in retrospect it seems that America's robust industrial capacity assured its victory over the Axis, success was not sudden. The United States initially experienced a series of military disasters and watched Japan take more territory in Southeast Asia and the Pacific including Guam, the Philippines, capturing tens of thousands of U.S. troops, thousands of whom died on the way to and within prisoner camps, and other Pacific islands, 
The largest American surrender in American history, involving 78,000 American and Filipino troops, occurred in the Philippines. But the tide of the war changed in the late spring of 1942, with American naval victories at Midway Island and in the Coral Sea. These successes allowed the United States to begin a step-by-step, island-hopping campaign to reclaim vital and strategic territories in the Pacific. The Grand Alliance led by American Franklin Roosevelt, English Winston Churchill, and Soviet Joseph Stalin, banded together to stop Hitler at any cost. Each leader had different goals in mind, but Churchill's plan to invade North Africa won out over other strategic considerations. And Churchill maintained that the Allies needed to attack the soft underbelly of the Axis. In November 1942, British and American forces invaded North Africa, and by May of 1943, forced the surrender of German forces there. By this time, the Allies had also gained an advantage in the fight in the Atlantic Ocean against German submarines. While Roosevelt wanted to liberate Europe, most American troops stayed in the Pacific. In July of 1943, American and British forces invaded Sicily and began the liberation of Italy, whose government, led by Mussolini, was overthrown by popular revolt. Fighting continued against German forces there throughout 1944. America's fight in Europe began on June 6, 1944, D-Day. On this date, nearly 200,000 American, British, and Canadian soldiers, led by General Dwight D. Eisenhower, invaded Normandy in northern France. More than a million troops soon followed them, in the largest sea land operation in history. The Germans resisted, but retreated, and by August, Paris had been liberated. The most significant clashes, however, took place on the Eastern Front, where millions of Germans and Soviet troops faced each other in very costly battles, particularly at Stalingrad, where a German siege ended in a German surrender to the Soviets, a decisive defeat for Hitler. Other Russian victories marked the end of Hitler's advance and the beginning of the end of the Nazi Empire in Eastern Europe. A full 10 million of Germany's nearly 14 million casualties were inflicted on the Eastern Front, and millions of Poles and Russians, many of them civilians, perished. Moreover, after 1941, Hitler embarked on his final solution to eliminate people and groups he deemed undesirable, including Slavs, Gypsies, homosexuals, and above all, Jews. By 1945, six million Jewish men, women, and children had died in Nazi camps in the culmination of a horrifying Nazi ideology known as the Holocaust. This image shows some of the 13,000 American troops forced to surrender to the Japanese on Corregidor Island in the Philippines in May of 1942. This image shows American Army reinforcements waiting ashore on Saipan, one of the Mariana Islands, during one of the bloodiest battles in the island-hopping campaign in the Pacific theater of World War II. Although the Japanese Navy never fully recovered from its defeats at the Coral Sea and Midway in 1942, it took three more years for American forces to near the Japanese homeland. This is an image of German prisoners of war. Most of the land fighting in Europe took place on the Eastern Front, between the German and Soviet armies. This is a photograph showing prisoners of a German concentration camp that were liberated by Allied troops in 1945. By the end of World War II, some 50 million men had registered for the draft, and 10 million had been inducted into the military. Military service united Americans from every walk of life, bringing the children of immigrants into contact with other Americans from a variety of racial and geographical backgrounds. Further, the draft ensured that the burden of military engagement was widely shared throughout American society. Within the United States, the war transformed the role of the federal government. Roosevelt established new wartime agencies such as the War Production Board, War Manpower Commission, and Office of Price Administration to control labor distribution, shipping, set manufacturing quotas, and fix wages, prices, and rents. 
the number of federal workers rose from 1 million to 4 million, and unemployment, at a rate of 14% in 1940, virtually disappeared by 1943. The government built housing for war workers and forced civilian companies to produce material for the war effort. Auto plants now made trucks, tanks, and jeeps for the army. The gross national product more than doubled to $214 billion during the war. And federal wartime spending equaled twice the amount spent in all the previous 150 years. The government sold millions of dollars in war bonds, hiked taxes, and started taking income tax from Americans' paychecks. Ties between corporations and the federal government grew much closer during World War II. With business executives taking key positions in federal agencies supervising war industries, Roosevelt gave incentives to increase production. Most federal spending went to the largest companies, which sped up a long-term trend toward economic concentration. And by the war's end, the 200 biggest industrial firms represented nearly half of all corporate assets in the nation. Wartime production was gargantuan in scale and shocking in its intensity, not only making military equipment by the millions, but leading to inventions such as radar, jet engines, and early computers. The war helped restore the reputation of big business that the Depression had tarnished. Federal funds restored old manufacturing areas and fostered new ones. On the West Coast, in places like Southern California, home to steel and aircraft production, and in the South, where out-migration and military-related factories and shipyards shifted employment from agriculture to industry. This raised incomes in the South, but it did not end its deep poverty, sparse urbanization, or underdeveloped economy, which still depended on agriculture, extractive industries such as mining, lumber, and oil, and manufacturing linked to agriculture, such as cotton textiles. Organized labor saw the war as a struggle for freedom that would expand economic and political democracy at home and secure its influence in politics and industry. During the war, unions were part of a three-sided arrangement with government and business that allowed union membership to rise to unprecedented numbers. To win industrial peace and stabilize war production, the federal government forced resistant employers to recognize the unions. In turn, Union leaders promised not to strike and recognized employers' right to managerial prerogatives and fair profits. By the war's end, unions were entrenched in many economic sectors and nearly 15 million workers, a third of the non-farm labor workforce, were union members, which was the highest proportion in U.S. history. But labor was a less powerful partner in the war than business or government, The New Deal's decline continued during the war, and Congress became thoroughly dominated by a conservative alliance between Republicans and Southern Democrats, who retained Social Security, but ended programs allegedly controlled by leftists, such as the Civilian Conservation Corps, CCC, and Works Progress Administration, WPA. Many workers protested the demanding wartime conditions and the freeze on wages which had been imposed by the government even while corporate profits soared. Despite the no-strike pledge, 1943 and 1944 saw multiple brief walkouts. War-related production essentially ended the Great Depression. In this photograph from 1942, workers wait to be paid at a Maryland shipyard. As this map indicates, the military and naval facilities built by the federal government during World War II were concentrated in the South and West, sparking the economic development of these regions. World War II came to be remembered as the Good War, in which the nation united behind noble aims. But all wars need the mobilization of public opinion, and freedom was a prominent theme in efforts to sell the war. Roosevelt believed the four freedoms represented essential American values that could be universalized across the globe. Freedom from fear meant a desire not only for peace, but for long-term security in a chaotic world. The importance of freedom of speech and religion seemed self-evident, 
but their prominence emphasized the new significance of First Amendment protections of free expression. During the war, the Supreme Court's judges, contrasting American constitutional liberty with Nazi tyranny, upheld the rights of religious minorities to refuse to salute the American flag in public schools, as opposed to the coercive patriotism of World War I. Freedom from want seemed the most ambiguous of the four freedoms. Though FDR first used it to refer to eliminating barriers to trade, he soon linked this freedom to guaranteeing a standard of living for American workers and farmers by preventing a return of the Depression. FDR argued that this would bring real freedom for the common man. When Rockwell's paintings first appeared in the Saturday Evening Post, each was accompanied by an essay. The Filipino poet and American immigrant, Carlos Bolosan, wrote of those Americans still outside the social mainstream, and how, to them, freedom from want included having enough to eat, sending their children to school, and being able to participate fully in American life. In this recruitment poster for the Boy Scouts, a svelte Miss Liberty prominently displays the Bill of Rights, widely celebrated during World War II as the centerpiece of American freedom. This is a patriotic fan. Patriotic fan, which is marketed to women during World War II, illustrates how freedom and patriotism were closely linked. At the far left and right, owners are instructed in ways to help win the war and preserve American freedom. The five middle panels suggest some of the era's definitions of freedom. Freedom to listen, presumably without government censorship. Self-government, freedom of assembly, the right to choose one's work, and freedom to play. Founded in 1942, the Office of War Information, OWI, was created to mobilize public opinion. Political divisions created by the New Deal affected efforts to promote the four freedoms, with liberal Democrats dominating the writing staff and depicting the conflict as a people's war for freedom. The OWI was concerned that most Americans supported the war efforts out of a desire for revenge against the Japanese. To convince the American public that the war was being fought for the four freedoms, the OWI utilized radio, film, the press, and other media to give the conflict an ideological meaning, while avoiding the nationalist hysteria of World War I. The OWI utilized deep-seated American traditions, including notions of bringing freedom to the world, and the United States as the great emancipator. Critics of the OWI claimed that the freedom being promoted was Roosevelt's version of the 1930s. Congress eliminated most of its funding when, over concern that the OWI was promoting New Deal social programs just as much as the war effort. After the OWI was defunded, the selling of America became a private affair. Private companies joined in efforts to promote wartime patriotism under the guidance of the War Advertising Council. Alongside advertisements urging Americans to purchase war bonds, guard against revealing military secrets, and grow victory gardens, there was also an emphasis on marketing advertisers' definition of freedom. They insisted that Roosevelt had overlooked a fifth freedom, freedom of choice through free enterprise. Americans on the home front enjoyed a prosperity many could scarcely remember, despite the rationing of scarce consumer items. Marketers stressed that the possibilities for consumer goods were endless if they could remain free from government controls. Each side in World War II invoked history to rally support for its cause. Rise of Asia depicts Japan liberating Asia from ABCD imperial oppressors, Americans, British, Chinese, Dutch. This is another instance where each side in World War II was invoking history to rally support for its cause. This poster issued by the Office of War Information links the words of Abraham Lincoln to the struggle against Nazi tyranny. In this advertisement by the Liberty Motors and Engineering Corporation, published in the February 1944 issue of Fortune, Uncle Sam offers the fifth freedom, free enterprise, to war-devastated Europe. To spread its message, the company offered free enlargements of its ad, 
these images invoke pride in service on the home front. War mobilization sparked an unprecedented growth in women's employment to fill industrial jobs left by men. Government and private ads celebrated the independent women worker with images like Rosie the Riveter, the female industrial laborer painted by Norman Rockwell as a muscle-bound and self-reliant woman. With 15 million men in the military, in 1944, women made up one-third of the civilian workforce and 350,000 women served in auxiliary military units. Women filled industrial, professional, and government jobs that were previously barred to them, such as aircraft manufacturing and shipbuilding, and they forced some unions, like the United Auto Workers, to confront issues like equal pay for equal work, maternity leave, and child care. Many women who had a taste of freedom working men's jobs for male wages hoped to remain in the workforce after the war. Yet government, employers, and unions saw women's work as only a temporary wartime necessity. Though ads told women working in factories that they were fighting for freedom, their language promoted victory, not women's rights or independence. After the war, most women war workers, especially those in high-paying industrial positions, lost their jobs to men. Indeed, war ads informed Americans that their work would help secure the American way of life, after the war, traditional families, with the women at home and men at work, enjoying household appliances and consumer goods. This is an image of women workers during their lunch break at the Roundhouse of the Chicago and Northwestern Railroad in Clinton, Iowa, in 1943. This photograph captures the enthusiasm of three fly girls, female pilots employed by the Air Force to deliver cargo and passengers and test military aircraft. Known as WASPs, Women Air Force Service Pilots, they eventually numbered over 1,000 aviators who trained at an all-female base at Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas. They did not take part in combat, but 38 died in service. Dreams of post-war prosperity united New Dealers and conservatives and business and labor. And they were promoted by two of the most famous roadmaps for the post-war world. The American Century, published by the magazine magnate Henry Luce in 1941 to mobilize Americans for an imminent war, asked Americans to prepare to become the dominant power in the world and distribute to all peoples American magnificent industrial products and great American ideals, particularly their love of freedom. Luce believed that American power and values would secure unprecedented prosperity and abundance, all created by free economic enterprise. The idea that America had a mission to spread democracy and freedom had its origins in the American Revolution, but this idea traditionally saw America as an example to be emulated, not an active agent imposing an American system on others. To some critics on the left, Luce's appeal seemed to be a call for American empire, Henry Wallace, a liberal New Dealer, former Secretary of Agriculture for FDR and FDR's vice president beginning in 1940, responded with The Price of Free World Victory, an address in May 1942. Wallace anticipated that Allied victory would establish a century of the common man and that the March of Freedom would continue after the conflict. He argued the globe would be governed by international cooperation, not any single power, and that governments would humanize capitalism and redistribute economic resources to end hunger, illiteracy, and poverty. Luce and Wallace defined freedom differently. Luce envisioned a world of free enterprise, while Wallace sought a global New Deal. But they also both believed America should intervene in the world by spreading abundance and posing as a model to other nations. And they ignored other nations' visions of the post-war world. While Congress dismantled parts of the New Deal, liberal Democrats and their left-wing allies planned for a post-war economy that would enable all Americans to enjoy freedom from want. In 1942 and 1943, the National Resources Planning Board, NRPB, outlined a peacetime economy based on full employment, a larger welfare state, and an American standard of living. Emphasizing economic security and full employment, 
the NRPB called for a new Bill of Rights that would include all Americans in Social Security and guarantee education, health care, adequate housing, and employment. Liberal New Dealers, labor, farmer, and civil rights groups, and churches welcomed the NRPB's plan, whose promise of full employment and fair income distribution seemed to one liberal magazine to represent the way of life of free men. The reports showed that liberals were moving away from trying to reform capitalism to attaining full employment, social welfare, and mass consumption, with little direct government invention in the economy. They were influenced by John Maynard Keynes, who argued that government spending was the best way to foster economic growth. Although war production had ended the Depression in a kind of military Keynesianism, the NRPB proposed a continuation of Keynesianism in the post-war period. But an increasingly conservative Congress opposed the NRPB plan and cut the agency's funding. Even as wartime industrial production boomed, propaganda posters promoting support for the war effort celebrated rural and small-town America. Despite the new independence enjoyed by millions of women, World War II propaganda posters emphasized the male-dominated family as an essential element of American freedom. This pamphlet, produced by the Office for Emergency Management for Labor Day in 1942, invoked the 19th-century ideal of free labor to describe the battle against the Axis powers. In 1944, FDR, who knew that most Americans wanted a guarantee of employment after the war, called for an economic Bill of Rights. While the original Bill of Rights limited government power to secure liberty, this one expanded government power to secure full employment, a minimum income, medical care, education, and decent housing for all Americans. FDR declared that true individual freedom cannot exist without economic security and independence. But his replacement of Vice President Henry Wallace with Harry Truman of Missouri suggested that he did not want to confront Congress over social policy. And Congress never enacted the Economic Bill of Rights. In 1944, Congress did enact the Servicemen's Readjustment Act, or GI Bill of Rights, which extended to millions of returning veterans benefits such as unemployment, educational scholarships, low-cost mortgages, pensions, and job training. The GI Bill greatly shaped post-war America and was one of the most far-reaching pieces of social legislation in American history. It prevented post-war economic disruptions and sparked a boom in education and housing, which led to massive suburbanization. But Congress went no further. A proposed full employment bill that would have been a GI Bill for non-veterans, guaranteeing employment and requiring the federal government to increase spending if the economy itself did not produce full employment, was watered down before it passed in 1946 and did not require full employment. The bill's failure confirmed the political stalemate initiated in the 1938 elections and marked the return of respectability for the idea that economic planning endangered freedom. In 1944, Friedrich A. Hayek, an Austrian-born economist, published The Road to Serfdom, in which he argued that government planning threatens individual liberty and leads to dictatorship. When war production seemed to have restored capitalism and fascism showed the dangers of combining economic and political power, Hayek's book gave a new justification to opponents of the activist state. Hayek claimed that no person or set of experts could ever know enough to intelligently direct a complex modern economy, and that the free market's scattered and partial knowledge more effectively ran economic life. While Hayek accepted some social policies such as minimum wage and maximum hour laws, and a social safety net that guaranteed minimal citizen welfare and opposed traditional conservatism's love of authority, he helped establish modern conservatism by equating fascism, socialism, and the New Deal, and associating economic planning with a loss of freedom. This is Ben Shahn's poster, Our Friend. For the Congress of Industrial Organizations Political Action Committee, it urges workers to vote for FDR during his campaign for a fourth term. This is another This is America propaganda poster. It emphasizes the American dream of equal opportunity for all. All the children in the classroom, however, 
are white boys, and the poster seems to limit the American dream to males. This is a poster issued by the Fair Employment Practices Commission. It was created in 1941 to combat discrimination in military-related jobs. The workers building a tank represent numerous European ethnic groups, but not non-whites, even though the commission was created to forestall a planned march on Washington organized by black leaders. World War II changed Americans' vision of themselves as a people. The fight against the Nazi empire and its theory of a master race discredited ethnic and racial inequalities. The cultural pluralism of ethnic and racial minorities in the 1920s and the popular front in the 1930s was now promoted by the government. It argued that the United States differed from its enemies in its commitment to the principle that Americans of all races, religions, and national origins could enjoy the four freedoms. Racism was the doctrine of the enemy, while Americanism meant tolerating diversity and equality. By the war's end, the new immigrants had been accepted as loyal, ethnic Americans, rather than members of inferior races. World War II brought the new immigrants and their children together with other Americans, drawing millions from urban ethnic neighborhoods and rural areas, and mixing them in factories and the military. This patriotic assimilation was in stark contrast to the coercive Americanism of World War I, in which the Wilson administration made Anglo-Saxonism a cultural norm. Roosevelt embraced cultural pluralism as a basis of harmony in a diverse society, and the government promoted Americanism as a quality in opposition to Nazi intolerance. Public officials rewrote the past to define American identity as free of racial or ancestral considerations. Repelled by Nazi ideas of inborn racial differences, biological and social scientists discarded the belief that race, culture, and intelligence were linked. Even Hollywood depicted soldiers as a motley force of men from diverse regional, ethnic, and religious backgrounds who placed national loyalty above other identities. Bigotry certainly remained part of American life. Anti-Semitism still contributed to the government's offer of refuge to no more than a handful of European Jews escaping the Nazis. But the war made millions of ethnic Americans feel fully American for the first time. But patriotic assimilation stopped at the color line. The war had a less definite meaning for non-white groups. Before Pearl Harbor, racial barriers were still intact. Southern blacks were confined by segregation, and Asians could not emigrate to the United States or become naturalized citizens. Mexican Americans had been deported during the Depression, and most American Indians still lived in deep poverty on reservations. But the war started changes that would have an impact on the post-war period. Under the Bracero Program, which was launched in 1942, tens of thousands of contract laborers migrated from Mexico to the United States to work as domestic and agricultural workers. The program, designed as a temporary war measure, lasted until 1964 and brought a total of 4.5 million Mexican workers into the country. The Braceros were assured decent housing and wages, but were not citizens and could be deported at any time. The war also offered opportunities to second-generation Mexican-Americans to move and find work and contributed to the making of the new Chicano culture that fused Mexican heritage and American experience. For Mexican-American women in particular, the war afforded new opportunities, and Rosita the Riveter took her place alongside Rosie in West Coast multi-ethnic war production factories. Yet the Zoot Suit riots of 1943 in Los Angeles, in which sailors and police attacked Mexican-American youths wearing flashy clothing, showed the extent of wartime tolerance. But the contrast between discrimination and wartime rhetoric of freedom and pluralism inspired civil rights activism among Mexican-Americans, such as protests against employment discrimination. Roughly half a million Mexican-American men and women served in the military. Discrimination against Mexicans became an increasing embarrassment in Roosevelt's good neighbor nation. Texas, the state with the highest population of people of Mexican descent, passed the Caucasian Race Equal Privileges Resolution, which stated that all Caucasians, including Mexicans, deserved equal treatment in places of public accommodation. This statute did not challenge segregation of blacks and lacked any enforcement mechanism. In 
Discrimination was so bad that Mexico prohibited Texas from receiving Bracero laborers for a time. One series of posters issued by the Office of War Information it was used to mobilize support for the war and emphasized respect for the country's racial and ethnic diversity. This one, directed at Hispanics, suggests that there is no contradiction between pride in ethnic heritage and loyalty to the United States. This is a sign on the Tarrant County Courthouse in Fort Worth, Texas in 1942. Racial segregation extended to prison visiting hours. Wartime propaganda in the United States sought to inspire hatred against the Pacific foe. This poster, issued by the U.S. Army, recalls the Bataan Death March in the Philippines. The war also drew into the nation's mainstream many American Indians, thousands of whom served in the Army, left the reservations for war work, not all of whom returned, and took advantage of GI Bill benefits. In contrast, Asian Americans' experience was a paradox. More than 50,000 children of immigrants from China, Japan, Korea, and the Philippines fought in the army, mostly in all Asian units. With China as an ally, Congress in 1943 ended exclusion and established a very small quota for Chinese immigration. But many Chinese moved out of ethnic ghettos to work alongside whites in the war industry. Japanese Americans had a very different experience. While many Americans viewed the war in Europe as an ideological conflict with Nazism, Americans and Japanese viewed the Pacific War as a racial war. Japan's propaganda portrayed America as contaminated with ethnic and racial diversity, as opposed to the racially pure Japanese, while the attacks at Pearl Harbor stirred long-standing anti-Asian prejudice. Government propaganda depicted the Japanese as animalistic and subhuman and blamed Japan's aggression on racial or national characteristics. Most Japanese Americans in the mainland United States worked on farms in California, and while one-third were first-generation immigrants, the majority were Nisei, American-born citizens, many of whom spoke only English and had never been to Japan. Though the government mobilized German and Italian Americans in the war effort and arrested few of the non-naturalized among them, it viewed every person of Japanese ethnicity as a potential enemy. The military, facing an explosion of anti-Asian sentiment and fearing an invasion, persuaded Roosevelt to issue Executive Order 9066 in early 1942. That expelled all persons of Japanese descent from the West Coast. More than 110,000 men, women, and children two-thirds of whom were American citizens, were removed to internment camps far from home, where they were confined in an environment of military discipline and surveillance. Nonetheless, the internees did their best to create an atmosphere of home by decorating their living spaces and setting up activities like sports clubs and art classes for themselves. Internment demonstrated how easily war erodes basic civil liberties. No court hearings, due process, or writs of habeas corpus challenged the internment, which was supported almost universally by the press, Congress, and public opinion. The Supreme Court, in Korematsu v. the United States, upheld the policy, arguing that an order applying only to Japanese was not based on race. In 2018, in a case involving President Trump's order banning travel to the United States by citizens of several Muslim-majority countries, the Supreme Court, as an aside, declared that the Korematsu decision was gravely wrong and it had no legal standing. Internees were asked to buy war bonds, sign loyalty oaths, and consent to being drafted into the army. Contradictions abounded in the experience of Japanese Americans. For example, in 1944, Sono Isatu danced on Broadway while her brother served in the Pacific Theater, and her father was interned because he had been born in Japan. A long campaign for acknowledgement followed the war, and in 1988, Congress apologized for internment and compensated victims. This shows an image of a mother and her child waiting to go to an internment camp. The entrance to a grocery store in Oakland, California, in a photograph by Dorothea Lang in March 1942. The owner, Tatsuro Masuda, a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, had the sign painted the day after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor as an expression of loyalty to the nation. Like other Japanese Americans, he and his family were interned. 
More than 100,000 Japanese Americans, the majority American citizens, were forcibly moved from their homes to internment camps during World War II. In contrast to the treatment of Japanese Americans, wartime rhetoric of freedom helped spark significant changes in the status of blacks. While Roosevelt denounced theories of racial mastery, Nazi Germany cited American segregation to support its own policies. Yet segregation and racial violence persisted. The war stimulated a massive migration of blacks, the second Great Migration from the rural South to cities in the North and West, but they faced intense hostility, especially in Detroit, where a 1943 fight led to a race riot that killed 34 people and led to a hate strike of white workers against black employment at a war production plant. Lynching continued unabated. Nevertheless, more than one million blacks served in the armed forces in segregated units, limited mostly to construction, transportation, and other non-combat duties. Many northern black draftees were sent to the South for military training, where they resented the discrimination they faced, and the better treatment given to Nazi prisoners of war. When Southern black veterans sought the benefits of the GI Bill, they faced discrimination that sharply limited their access. While the GI Bill did not discriminate in its health, college tuition, job training, or other benefits, local administrators in the South curtailed, eliminated, or segregated these benefits to the blacks' disadvantage. During World War II, Red Cross blood banks separated blood from black and white Americans, one illustration of the persistence of racial segregation. This 1943 poster by the NAACP points out that the concept of Negro and white blood has no scientific basis. This is The Enemy, a 1942 poster by Victor Ancona and Carl Kohler, suggests a connection between Nazism abroad and lynching at home. The modern civil rights movement was born during the war. Resentful of the nearly complete exclusion of African Americans from jobs in the booming war industries, the black labor leader A. Philip Randolph, in July 1941, called for a march on Washington to demand defense jobs, an end to segregation, and an anti-lynching law. Randolph, who founded the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and fought the racism of unions and employers, criticized Roosevelt's inaction by using FDR's rhetoric, declaring racial discrimination undemocratic, un-American, and pro-Hitler. The March idea alarmed Washington officials, and to prevent it, Roosevelt issued an executive order that banned discrimination in defense jobs and created a Fair Employment Practices Commission, FEPC, to track compliance. Armed only with investigative powers, the FEPC could not enforce the anti-discrimination order, but its creation signaled an important shift in public policy. The FEPC was the first agency since Reconstruction to fight for equal opportunity for blacks, and it helped obtain jobs for black workers in industrial factories and shipyards. By 1944, more than one million blacks worked in manufacturing. During the war, the NAACP's membership rose from 50,000 to 500,000. The Congress of Racial Equality, founded in 1942 by an interracial group of pacifists, held sit-ins in northern cities to integrate restaurants and theaters. In early 1942, the Pittsburgh Courier used the phrase that embodied black attitudes during the war, the double V. Victory over Germany and Japan, it argued, must be accompanied by victory over segregation in America. Black newspapers and black critics identified the gap between the Roosevelt administration's celebration of American ideals and the reality of race. During the war, a left-based but broad coalition called for an end to racial inequality in America. African-American and Jewish groups campaigned against discrimination in employment and housing. Despite resistance from many white workers, CIO unions, especially those influenced by leftists and communists, tried to organize black workers and win skilled positions for them. Although AFL unions continued to discriminate, CIO unions were far more racially integrated. This new militancy among blacks scared moderate white Southerners, who now stood between blacks protesting segregation and Southern politicians who defended white supremacy and the South's freedom to shape its own race relations. 
The war that sparked modern civil rights agitation also generated politics that anticipated the massive resistance to desegregation in the 1950s. But in the North and West, many liberals openly called for a transformation of race relations. Some changes occurred. The National War Labor Board banned racial wage differentials, and the Supreme Court outlawed all-white primaries, which had enabled Southern states to disenfranchise blacks. By the end of the war, the Navy ended segregation, and the Army had established a few integrated units. In 1942, Wendell Wilkie published One World, which sold more than a million copies. The book's great surprise came as Wilkie emphasized our imperialisms at home and called that a claim to world leadership would lack moral authority if racism was not addressed. This is a sign that was displayed opposite a Detroit housing project in 1942 and symbolizes one aspect of what Gunnar Myrdal called the American Dilemma, the persistence of racism in the midst of a worldwide struggle for freedom. This image is of black servicemen in Brooklyn, New York. They're flashing the double V sign, symbolizing the dual battle against Nazism abroad and racism at home. Paul Robeson, the black actor, singer, and battler for civil rights, is leading the Oakland dock workers in singing the national anthem in 1942. World War II gave a significant boost to the vision, shared by Robeson and others on the left, of an America based on genuine equality. This image shows a picket line of black workers in Chicago. It evokes the memory of slavery and protesting low wages in 1941. In early 1945, Allied triumph seemed inevitable. Hitler briefly pushed the Allies back in France with a surprise counterattack that created a huge bulge in Allied lines. Though the Battle of the Bulge was the largest single battle ever fought by the U.S. Army and inflicted 70,000 American casualties, the German assault failed, and by March, American troops had crossed into Germany. Hitler killed himself, Soviet troops took Berlin, and on May 8, VE Day, VE stood for victory in Europe, the war against Germany ended. U.S. forces in the Pacific moved closer to Japan after retaking Guam and the Philippines in 1944, and a decisive naval victory at Leyte Gulf. In the 1944 presidential election, Roosevelt defeated Thomas E. Dewey, Republican governor of New York, and won an unprecedented fourth term. But FDR died on April 12, 1945, before the Allies secured victory. His successor, Harry S. Truman, immediately faced an extraordinary decision, whether to use the atomic bomb against Japan. Truman, not knowing about the bomb before becoming president, was told by the Secretary of War that the United States had built the most terrible weapon ever known in human history. The bomb was the product of Einstein's theory of relativity, which led scientists to use uranium, or man-made plutonium, to create an atomic reaction that could generate enormous power, which could be used for peaceful purposes or to generate a colossal explosion. Fleeing Germany for the United States, Einstein warned Roosevelt that the Nazis were trying to build an atomic weapon and urged Roosevelt to do the same. FDR launched the Manhattan Project, the top-secret program in which scientists during the war developed an atomic bomb, which was first tested in New Mexico in July 1945. On August 6, 1945, a U.S. plane dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan, it virtually destroyed the entire city and killed 70,000 immediately. 140,000 more died from radiation by the end of 1945, and thousands more died in the next five years. Three days later, the United States dropped a second bomb on Nagasaki that killed 70,000. The same day, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan and invaded Manchuria. Japan quickly surrendered. The catastrophic number of civilian casualties caused by the bombs have ever since made them controversial. Japanese forces fiercely resisted America's advance in the Pacific, and Truman's advisors warned him that an American invasion of Japan might cost the lives of 250,000 or more American troops. But the United States did not plan to invade until 1946, and there were signs that Japan was close to surrender. Japan indicated that it would surrender if Emperor Hirohito retained his throne, 
but this did not meet Allied demands for unconditional surrender. In the end, the Allies let him stay. Some scientists who developed the atomic bomb asked Truman to use it just to show its power to other nations. Truman never hesitated to employ it. The use of the atomic bomb represented a logical endpoint to the way in which World War II was fought, namely at great cost to civilian life. Compared to World War I, in which 90% of deaths were military personnel, in World War II, 20 million of the 50 million who died were civilians. The Nazi regime had systematically killed its enemies, including millions of Jews, and bombed London and other cities. The Allies in turn bombed German cities, such as Dresden, where 100,000 civilians perished. In March 1945, nearly the same number died in the U.S. bombing of Tokyo. Although the war and government propaganda led many Americans to dehumanize the Japanese and few criticized Truman's use of the bomb, public criticism, aroused by images of civilian suffering, mounted. This is an image of a school in Hiroshima after the bomb. This is Fat Man, the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki, Japan, on August 9, 1945. During the conflict, meetings between Allied leaders outlined the architecture of international relations in the post-war period. Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin met in Iran in 1942, and at the Yalta Conference in the Soviet Union in 1945 to develop agreements. The last Big Three conference occurred at Potsdam, outside Berlin, in July of 1945, and involved Stalin, Truman, and Churchill. There, Allied leaders created a military administration for Germany and agreed to try Nazi officials for war crimes. None of the three great Allied powers entirely trusted the others, and each vied for geostrategic advantage. The Allies' decision to delay the invasion of Europe cost many Russian lives on the Eastern Front and incited Soviet resentment. But their sacrifice persuaded Britain and the United States to allow the Soviet Union to dominate Eastern Europe. At Yalta, Roosevelt and Churchill barely protested Stalin's plans to control areas of Eastern Europe that had been part of the Russian Empire before World War I. Stalin agreed to enter the war on Japan later in 1945 to include non-communists in the pro-Soviet Polish government and to allow free elections there. But Stalin intended to make Eastern Europe communist, and soon the Allies disagreed over the region's fate. Churchill also resisted U.S. pressure to move toward national independence for India and other British colonies, and he made separate, private deals with Stalin to split southern and eastern Europe into separate spheres of influence. Britain also fought American efforts to control the post-war global economy. Delegations from 45 nations that met at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire, in July of 1945 replaced the British pound with the U.S. dollar as the main currency for international exchange. During the Depression, FDR had taken the United States off the gold standard, but Bretton Woods again forged a link between the dollar and gold, and set other national currencies at a fixed rate in relation to the U.S. dollar. The meeting also created two U.S.-dominated financial institutions. The World Bank would provide money to developing nations and help rebuild Europe, and the International Monetary Fund would prevent governments from devaluing their currencies for trade advantages. Bretton Woods created the structure of the post-war global capitalist economy that made goods and investment more free and recognized that American dominance of world finance. American leaders asserted that free trade would encourage world economic growth, an assumption that continued to govern U.S. foreign policy until the presidency of Donald Trump. This is an image of the Big Three, Stalin, Roosevelt, and Churchill, at their first meeting in Tehran, Iran, in 1943, where they discussed the opening of a second front against Germany in Western Europe. In 1944, near Washington, D.C., the Allies also founded a successor organization to the League of Nations. The United Nations, UN, would consist of a general assembly of nations where each member nation had an equal voice and a security council tasked with maintaining world peace and security. The Security Council had six rotating members and five permanent ones. Britain, China, France, the Soviet Union, and the United States 
each with the power to veto resolutions. In June of 1945, 51 countries meeting in San Francisco adopted the UN Charter, which outlawed force or its threat as a means for settling international disputes, and Congress endorsed it the following month. The war radically redistributed world power. The major military powers of Japan and Germany were defeated. Britain and France were weakened. While only America and the Soviet Union could still project their own power on the international stage, the United States essentially became the dominant nation in the world. But international harmony did not follow the peace. Soviet occupation of Eastern Europe soon helped spark the Cold War, and the atomic bombs inspired much fear across the globe. Allied rhetoric of freedom was not always followed in post-war policy. In 1941, Winston Churchill and FDR issued the Atlantic Charter, which assured that Nazi Germany's defeat would be followed by free trade, self-government for all nations, and a global New Deal. It specifically embraced freedom from want and freedom from fear, but left out the other two of the four freedoms in deference to British colonial rule in India, where Britons preferred not to grant freedom of speech and worship. The Four Freedoms and the Atlantic Charter were intended to solidify world opposition to Axis powers, but it also laid the foundation of human rights and inspired colonized peoples to adopt the language and ideals of freedom and national self-determination, and use them in their struggles against the victorious Allied countries, causing more conflict and war in the future. This is a member of the U.S. Navy who is playing Going Home on the accordion as Franklin D. Roosevelt's body is carried from the Warm Springs Foundation where he died suddenly on April 12, 1945. 